Okay, so today we're going to review a t-shirt. A t-shirt that I got from a company called Sweat Taylor. Um, this is going to be a cotton model t-shirt 50-50, uh, actually using Supima cotton, which we'll get into in a little bit. I paid $54 for the t-shirt, and I want to tell you that um, when you want to buy a t-shirt, and it's not a commodity item that you find off the rack in a retail store, you're going to pay a little bit extra, probably more than really what it should retail for. But these unique items that these uh, smaller companies are making, um, you're going to have to pay the price for because that's what they need to sell it for, for the small quantities that they make. Uh, believe me, they're paying extra uh, just to get these things done. And I think this particular one is going to be made in the USA. Um, I'm a t-shirt person. Uh, if I could, I would wear t-shirts all day long to work and everything. Uh, you don't, can't always do that. But uh, for me, they're the most comfortable. And when you get the right fabric, the right fit, and, and uh, I guess the right fabric, the right fit where it feels great, then it's something that you're going to want to wear all day. And um, sometimes you'll see me uh, often in a Henley. And that's only because of the fit for the Henley seems uh, a little bit better for me because I tend to be in between maybe a large and an extra large. So I opt for the large and uh, they're tight. And when they're tight across the chest, you get pulling here, which pulls the neckline up. And I find that uncomfortable because it pushes against my neck and my shirt keeps wanting to ride back on me. So anyways, uh, that's what I look for in a t-shirt. I like them to be light on the light side. So a typical t-shirt is 150 GSM. I look for 150 and down uh, because I think those are going to be more comfortable. And when I think of my favorite t-shirt in my closet, it's been washed to death. Um, maybe even has a hole in it. Maybe some of you all can relate to that. And it's your favorite shirt. And just from the multiple washes, they lose weight each time because cotton gets rinsed out and uh, gets lighter and lighter and even maybe see-through in some places. You know, uh, Threadbare, which is an Under Armour. I think, or, or a Nike, uh, actually off brand, you know, sub brand for them. But really, that's what you, I, you know, feels good. So it, it's really what I think is happening is the reason why you like it is because it's light, it breathes, and uh, that's what makes it comfortable. But regardless, I would like to start a series of these videos looking for the ideal t shirt. And uh, we'll kick it off with this one and just to tell you a little history about what where the t-shirt came from in history and how we got to about to wearing them uh, started in about the 1860s where people used to wear what was called a union suit so a union suit is a one-piece item including the underwear it probably came like mid leg uh, it was designed to keep you warm to wear underneath your clothes um, you would see women wore it in the winter time so they wouldn't have to wear an overcoat which would hide their figure and make them look bulky so they could wear a dress with a corset underneath and this underneath the corset so it would keep them warm. Workers started wearing them in the industrial age in that, that time frame also to keep warm during the winter. So during the summer when things started to heat up what would happen is uh, they would cut them in half, not wear the bottoms, just wear the tops, and just wear the tops uh, only, no shirt over it. Uh, this was allowed in some places because uh, where the conditions that people were working in, uh, they weren't out in the public eye and they were allowed to dress like that. But actually there were laws that were passed, I think in the 1890s, which uh, said that you, if that type of garment must be worn underneath another garment and cannot be your primary uh, article of clothing. So uh, it was kind of, in a sense, outlawed. Um, right about this time also is the development of the zipper. So the zipper came about in the 1890s, um, moving into, really didn't get adopted into clothing that was more for shoes into the 19, late, late 1920s, early 1930s. So, and that's important too, because at this time then, people only had button and buttonhole really to uh, close their uh, shirts with. There was no zipper front, there was no quarter zip type of thing. It was button, buttonhole, or it was a pullover. Um, 
right around 1904, you had a company called Cooper Underwear Company, which came out with the bachelor shirt. The bachelor shirt was based our current, what we call our undershirt today. Um, they called it the bachelor shirt. And that's where you get your first shirt that's really designed to be worn underneath your clothing. So it, it served a bunch of functions. One is it kept your outer clothing clean because you sweat it into your undershirt, not your regular shirt. So no pit stains. Remember, there really wasn't deodorant at this time. Um, if you lost a button off your shirt and you're a bachelor, you can't sew them back on because men can't do that. Uh, in this day, in that day and age, at least nowadays, uh, I'm sure uh, you have to, you can't say that. But anyways, if you lost a button and your uh, shirt was exposed, your undershirt uh, underneath was covering your body. So it didn't, uh, it was allowed, so to speak. You could go out without missing a button and your undershirt underneath. In the early 1900s, you had the onset of World War I. Um, the Navy and the Army both came out with uh, dress codes, or I'm sorry, the Navy um, and the Army both came out with dress codes uh, requiring the uh, their soldiers to wear the undershirt underneath their uniform. And the Navy even said people working in the lower decks of the boat where maybe it was uh, uh, warm or hot conditions that they could actually forego wearing their uniform and just wear the T-shirt. The underneath. Um, in the 1920s, a novel came out by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And this is the first time that this undershirt now gets referred to as a t-shirt. And the primary reason for t-shirt is when you lay your t-shirt out on a table, it actually forms a T. And that's what uh, he commented on and it became um, the name that we all use now today, which is, you know, we call everything a t-shirt. So, and let me see, that book was called This Side of Paradise, and I think it was actually about a college student packing uh, to go away, and he was packing these t-shirts in his suitcase. Um, right around 1932, Jockey came out with a shirt designed for UC, USC football team to wear underneath their pads. So now you're getting into where this is getting into sports apparel active wear and really like kind of your first base layer uh, type of shirt. So this wore under their pads to keep their pads from chafing against their skin. And then by the 1950s, first Marlon Brando in a streetcar named Desire and then 1955 Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean. They're actually wearing their t-shirts only uh, in the movies. And so this sets a trend where now <clears throat> people are wearing t-shirts as um, an outer garment instead of a base garment. And that's kind of where we get the history of the t-shirt. So now, looking at this t-shirt that I bought, Sweat Tailor, right here. So we'll start reviewing this one. So this one's about 130 GSM, so right off the bat it's a little light. Um, I washed it once already, and you can see... Uh, really washed, came out of the dryer without any wrinkles. I just hung it up afterwards and uh, it stayed kind of wrinkle free. So this is really wonderful, you know, because the last thing you want to do is have to iron a t-shirt. Uh, you don't want it to wrinkle. So this is 50-50 cotton model and I mentioned Supima cotton. So some of the materials to me that are make a t-shirt uh, are, is it's always going to have to be primarily cotton. Uh, these shirts that are um, polyester or nylon that are geared more towards the athlete to me that's not what i'm looking for i'm looking for the comfort of cotton for an all day long shirt i like working out in those polyesters and nylons uh, they're great for moisture wicking and how they handle your sweat but when it comes down to wearing it all day long to me those start chafing after a while and it's the cotton t-shirt that is gonna be the most comfortable for the long run. So we're gonna stick with cotton primary source. So you have different types of cotton. You have US cotton, which is one of the best cottons in the world. Uh, and it's considered good because of the length of the staple. So in the, the cotton ball that you pick off the cotton plant, 
that's really a bunch of fibers and those fibers have a length to them that US cotton is superior in length uh, when you talk about Asian cotton or Pakistani cotton or things like that matter of fact a lot of those countries purchase cotton from the US for that very reason now you have two other types of cotton one is called Supima and Pima so Pima is a more of a uh, it's a brand of cotton it's longer than the US staple it's a little bit more expensive and the reason why the length of that staple uh, is important is because when you form a cotton yarn, you know, you take the cotton and you kind of comb it so all that ball opens up and all the fibers are running in uh, the same direction. And then they kind of overlap each other and that's how you form the yarn. The more they overlap, the more friction you get and it keeps that yarn from being able to be pulled apart and broken. So the longer the fiber, the more contact between the two and uh, two different fibers and therefore more friction and it holds together better, makes a stronger yarn. And in terms of yarn, the finer the yarn, the thinner, the more luxurious it's gonna f the fabric's gonna feel. Um, we're all familiar with bed sheets being 400 thread count, 800 thread count. Well, the reason, the way they get those counts up higher is by making the yarn thinner. So you get more yarn in less space uh, or more threads in less space and it feels softer and uh, maybe a little looks shinier um, and you get better quality. <clears throat> so in order to get that yarn to be thin but yet strong, it you need the longer staple fiber uh, in there. So therefore US cotton is pretty, uh, pretty good for everything. Pima cotton is a little bit improvement, and then Supima supposedly better than that. Um, they're all Western hemif Hemisphere cottons as far as I know, and get certified by a board, I think the uh, Supima board or Pima board, but, um, and if it's not, then it's not real. Uh, but anyways, so that's what Supima cotton is. It doesn't necessarily feel better than anything else. It gives you the impression that it does, uh, but Regular cotton and Supima cotton can feel the same. As a matter of fact, experts probably can't tell the difference without actually going into a lab and checking it. So, secondly, after your, because what makes a good t-shirt is gonna be your, your feel, your hand feel, so it's gotta be soft, so material is primary. Uh, Model is, a, is the other fiber that's in this t-shirt, and in previous videos I told you what Model is. It comes from, I think, pine trees, where they crush out the, the crush the pine trees into a pulp, extract their a cellulose material from it, turn that into fiber, and uh, <clears throat> you create your viscose fabrics. So the viscose uh, class of fabrics include tensile, lysel, model. Um, you have your bamboo rayon, um, etc. Poly uh, not polyester. I'm sorry, and what sometimes just called viscose. So anyways, they're all basically the same thing. They have a little bit different properties each. Model tends to be very soft. Um, it tends to have problems with wrinkling, but uh, blended with the cotton, it seems like it's causing it to behave. Um, anyways, uh, this is called an intimate yarn where the two yarns are blended, the uh, two different fibers are blended together in one yarn. Sometimes it, we can have where they're not intimate, but separate and then that uh, creates a different type of product and when we come across it we'll discuss it further um, the fit now the fit I'd like to we'll change uh, cameras here in a second but to go over the fit that's where you have you would think with a t-shirt that it's really not that big a deal but there's so many different things that go into account to making a garment fit right and we'll go over that at the same time while we talk about construction. All right, so let's talk about construction and let's talk about fit at the same time. So one of the things that is an important measurement on a t-shirt that you're gonna notice right off the bat is that there's a drop here in the back of the neck. So that's called the back neck drop. It's very important for comfort and you don't want your shirt hang, uh, hiking up on the back of your head. You also have here 
the front net drop, which to me is also a primary concern um, because otherwise I'm always pulling down on the front of my shirt and stretching my collar out. So you don't want that, right? And as I mentioned, if the chest is too tight and it gets pulling, you get pulling across here, you could see what causes the, the neck to go up. So it's important, that is a responsibility obviously of the buyer to make sure you're buying the size that fits. The next thing that you'll notice here is the shoulder drop. So this slope is real important. And of course, so many people are different. So it's important that you also, uh, for the manufacturer to try and just find the average spot. If this is dropping down too fast, then when the wearer puts it on, they're gonna pull this up and the shirt's gonna wanna break right there and have a wrinkle. And you might've seen this in some men's dress shirts that happens often where uh, the, the slope here is too, too severe and you get wrinkling right along the collar line um, <coughs> and uh, causes a problem. And vice versa, if this is uh, dropping too slowly, then when you put it on, this is gonna stick up like a point here and uh, it almost look like you're wearing shoulder pads or something like that in your shirt. This line here, because of the curve, we call that it's cut on the bias. So it's, it's actually something difficult to sew because this neckline while you're sewing will grow tremendously because there is no stability there in the fabric holding that shape. So the actual sewer has to uh, be very careful. And that goes for the back as well. It's part of the reason why we use this ribbing here in the, uh, as a collar to hold it in place and we don't just hem the shirt. For this neckline, you also have here a, a reinforced tape. So this is gonna help prevent the fabric from uh, losing too much shape and it reinforces this stitching. So you have a stitch holding the collar to the body fabric and then you have this on top of it with the double top stitch holding it in place. And here you'll see the seam, and then you can see the two rows of stitching on either side. This line here should come across also the shoulders and hold those in place, and this one does. So it's a, a very nice make. I wish that they didn't have this label here and used a heat seal. That would make it a lot more comfortable. Um, and that's a cheesy looking cheap way to put a label in. Looks like it was an afterthought. So you have the same here in the sleeve. This is bias. It's designed to stretch. Um, <coughs> and you see the seam used here is just a very narrow uh, stitch. This is called a counter stitch machine. I'm sorry, an overlock machine. And uh, it's a good stitch to use. Very fine. We don't want a wide stitch there, uh, a wide seam there. This particular company used this same double top stitch reinforced seam with the taping, uh, self-fabric taping uh, on the side seam. That is not common. That's an extra step and it's a nice touch. Uh, if you ever had your seam split open here on the side of a shirt, um, then this would be something that you would look for in a shirt because it's certainly uh, preventing that. The bottom hem and the hem of the sleeves are using what's called a cover stitch. So the fabric is folded over one time, and then this stitch is designed to cover that raw edge. And you see the quality of the sewing is terrific here, because otherwise, sometimes what you see is the raw edge of the fabric going out beyond the stitch, and then that frays in the wash and uh, leaves you with threads hanging from the bottom of your shirt or out your armhole, which you don't want. So that's the basic points you have of making a nice shirt. The side seams are typically straight. The bottom hem should be straight across as well. Uh, some are cut with a Active US military personnel <clears throat> traveling with us on flight 2051 to San Francisco. You're welcome to pre-board at this time. Thank you. Please remain seated until the next flight is ready to board. Okay, so the Sweat Taylor uh, shirt, I think I mentioned the price, $54. Uh, 
this is a sage green cotton model um, t-shirt and uh, I wore it yesterday I traveled to New York I saw two customers I wore a sport coat on top of it so it would look uh, a little bit professional not just wearing a plain t-shirt uh, to visit them and it turned out anyways it was so hot I had to take it off but uh, it, it uh, was for informal meetings anyways um, but terrific shirt I wore it for 12 uh, I want to say 16 hours straight so there was no no complaints there um, it fits fine I you know would say that it has to be up to the individual about the weight of the fabric um, as far as and the drapiness as it's gonna show a lot uh, so anyways we'll have to see um, how are other t-shirts compared to this one but I would say this one is definitely in the plus column uh, that I would wear want to wear it again and keep it in my closet uh, so if you want to produce something like this a quality t-shirt um, I work for Aurora Investment Global we are the largest uh, capacity supplier out of Vietnam we have 22 factories and we can manufacture knits and wovens in most categories from activewear to tailored clothing give me a call or send me an email um, if you like this video please subscribe to my youtube channel uh, you'll find it out over there on youtube mike levine and uh, click on the bell so that way you get notifications whenever i make a new video and in the meantime dress smart and i'll see you next time